from the Xerxes Society. I'm going to stop sharing my screen so Karen can share hers. Um, and we are so glad to welcome her for this presentation on pollinators this evening. Karen is the Farm Bill Pollinator Conservation Planner with Xerxes Society. In that role, she provides technical support and training to NRCS field office conservation planners and farmers, primarily in Southern Minnesota and Western Wisconsin. She's got a strong background in pollinator conservation and agriculture, and she holds a master's degree in ecology and evolutionary biology from Iowa State University, where she studied skipper butterfly conservation and grassland restoration in agroecosystems. And just as an aside, I've never actually had the pleasure of meeting Karen in person, but we've lived somewhat parallel lives um, and have certainly crossed paths professionally a lot, mostly via screens. So Karen, thank you so much for joining us tonight. It's really a pleasure to have you here. And I can't wait to hear what you have to teach us about pollinators this evening. Um, before I totally hand it over to Karen, I am going to just put in a quick plug for Zoom etiquette. Um, we will hold Q&A until the end of Karen's talk, but please feel free to submit questions as they occur to you via chat. Um, and then either Micah or myself will voice those questions and put them to Karen at the end of her presentation. All right, over to you, Karen. Thank you. Thank you, Amy, and everybody at BMAP, really, for doing all the amazing work you do and for putting on this series and um, for hosting me. So thank you. Um, I'm Karen Jokola. Um, Amy did a great introduction, so I'll just keep moving forward. Um, let's see here. Usually there's a lag right at the beginning, and then I'll get the, my computer will get the hang of it. Let's see here. Come on. <laughs> Oh, bumblebee, isn't it? Um, I don't know, Amy, if I if there's anything you can help me with here, but there we go. There it is. <laughs> it seems to happen a lot on Zoom for me. But in any case, for those of you who are not familiar with the Xerxes Society, um, I thought I would just give a quick overview of who we are, what we represent, and the kind of work we do. Uh, we're a nonprofit wildlife conservation organization that works to protect invertebrates and their habitats. Um, we take our name from the Xerxes blue butterfly pictured there on the right. It's the first butterfly to go extinct in North America due to human influenced habitat loss. Um, we are based in Portland, Oregon, but we have staff kind of all over the country. Um, like Amy said, I'm based in southeastern Minnesota, but I I visit with farmers and landowners across Minnesota and Wisconsin. Uh, we are coming up on our 50th, 50th year this year as an organization. So we've been around for a long time. We started as a butterfly organization or conservation organization and now have since kind of expanded our scope to protect all invertebrates. And I should just say invertebrates are uh, animals without a backbone, right? Um, and we, my executive director would want me to tell you that we are a member-based organization, much like public radio or something. Um, and so for those of you who in my audience right now who are members, I just want to thank you for helping us do this important work. Uh, we have several program areas. Our largest area and the program for which I work is the Pollinator and Agricultural Biodiversity Program. Uh, that yeah, like I said, that's our largest program. That's where we have the most boots on the ground. Um, but we also have a, a really strong endangered species program, a phenomenal pesticide protection program. We are, have a growing urban conservation program um, and various other kind of efforts. So I encourage you to go to our website and learn about kind of the work that we are doing. I, I just wanna explain a little bit about my particular role since I know some of you in the audience are landowners and who I could uh, potentially serve you directly in that uh, my position is um, as a partner biologist with the NRCS. Um, oops, there we go. Uh, and so the NRCS is a the branch of the USDA that's responsible for helping farmers with conservation. I'm going to pause for a second here and just touch base with Amy. Can you, am I blocking a little um, bit of the top of the screen? 
No, I can see okay. almost all the photos and definitely all the words. Perfect. Okay. <laughs> um, so just to cut to the chase, I uh, provide technical service to and technical support to any landowners uh, in Minnesota and Wisconsin. And that means that I can help you design seed mixes. I can help you navigate the farm bill programs to get financial assistance. Um, I work kind of at all levels of NRCS. So directly with the field office staff and also with state office staff to help revise um, technical documents and revise seed mixes and um, kind of revise their practice standards and everything. So that's just a little bit about my position. We have staff like this uh, kind of throughout the country working with closely with NRCS. So that's kind of the background on Xerces. And then what I wanna do is, I've, in my mind, I've broken this presentation into kind of the, the why, the, the who, and the how. So this is kind of the why. And I just wanna, I like to start here because um, pollinators are really popular these days, but I wanna even step back and give you some more perspective that um, invertebrate conservation in general, not just pollinator conservation is or really should be a top priority. Because when we think about the diversity of life on this planet, there's millions of species that are described, right? But over 70% over of those described species are represented by invertebrates. And when you bring that down even just to the animal kingdom, uh, then we've got this you know, it's overrepresentation, this huge diversity of um, species in the animal kingdom that are invertebrates. And I think when a lot of us think about wildlife conservation, we think about animals with a backbone, charismatic, large animals, even birds um, or pandas or whatever. Um, but we really should start to conjure up images of these invertebrates that are so important to the diversity of life on this planet. Because truly, if we don't have this diversity of life, um, we'll go down <laughs> with the rest of them. So the fate of the world's insects is truly inseparable from our own fates. Um, so if we care about soil health, we care about natural pest control uh, without using pesticides, um, if you care about crop pollination or high yields, all of these things, um, we really need to start focusing on invertebrate conservation because these are animals that are recycling nutrients above and below ground in terrestrial and aquatic systems. Um, they're offering free pest control services to us. Um, they're doing this valuable service of turning plants into food for other animals. So they eat the vegetation and then turn themselves into little protein packages for other animals to eat. Um, and of course, you know, what we're here to talk about today is that they're helping plants reproduce. So this is still the, the why. So why pollinator conservation? Because they're an ecological keystone. They um, are helping over 85% of flowering plants out there uh, fruit and bear seeds. Um, usually these flowering plants are pollinated by an animal. Usually it's an insect. Usually that insect is a bee um, and they require these invertebrates. And then, you know, pollination and the fruit that comes from pollination is essential for wildlife um, and just ecosystems in general, right? So if I just have a blueberry example here, but um, these bees will pollinate the blueberry flowers, they generate these wild fruits, although this picture probably is not wild, this is probably a cultivated blueberry, but still they're generating these fruits. And then animals, even like wolves, um, that you think of these top carnivorous predators do rely on blueberries. So this study came out um, of Northern Minnesota or out of Northern Minnesota um, last year showing that wolf packs are actually really reliant on wild blueberries in July to feed their young. Over like 83% of their diet made, was made up of blueberries. So these top predators are reliant on the vegetation and the invertebrates that help that vegetation reproduce. Maybe it goes without saying, and many, many of you in the audience already know this kind of argument, but you know, pollinators are essential for our own nutrition as well. Um, many of the foods that we prize for their, their high quality nutrients, their antioxidants, um, the foods that bring goodness to our lives like chocolate and coffee, 
um, berries, fruits, vegetables, the color in our diets, right? These are all, um, you know, thanks to pollinators. And of course, um, this has tremendous economic benefits as well. And then I don't wanna dwell on this too much. I could give a whole talk <laughs> on insect declines, um, but it is worth noting that pollinators are in decline. Uh, there have been studies after studies that have come out. Um, there, it's a tricky topic to address here in such a quick time frame, but basically 40% of invertebrate pollinator species may be at risk of extinction. That's from over a couple of years ago. I think there may be more evidence now. Um, there are a lot of species we still need to learn more about before we can document evidence of declines, but there are a few species that we do know about uh, because of very good record keeping over the last many, many decades. And one of those species is the rusty patch bumblebee. So probably those of you who are in southwestern Wisconsin have heard of this. This is the first um, federally listed endangered bumblebee. Um, it's, you can see on the left there, that's its former species range. And in the last couple of decades, um, that, drop, that population has just crashed. So those yellow um, points are kind of the population centers. Um, red spots are, are actual known populations. So like I said, I don't want to dwell on the declines because what we do know is that we, we know enough to act now and we need all hands on deck. So there's a lot of ways you can get involved. You can be uh, protecting existing habitat and that's crucial for all of you who live in this driftless area where there is still remnant habitat to protect, like start there <laughs> and then create new habitat that's hopefully contiguous with that uh, remnant habitat. And if you don't have possibility, you know, the opportunity to work hands-on in these environments, just educate yourself like you're doing right now and then educate others. Um, participate in policymaking. There's a lot of cool legislation being proposed right now in Minnesota for pollinator conservation. Um, so get involved that way, that matters. Okay, so that kind of wraps up the, the why. And now I wanna talk about the, the who, or I guess you could say the what, but I like to think of who. Um, so who are these pollinators? Like what is a pollinator anyway? Um, I think it's really important for us to kind of define our terms and learn about these invertebrates if we are going to design effective conservation strategies. So I wanted you to just kind of look at all these different kinds of insects that are visiting flowers, think about which ones might be a pollinator, which ones might not. And then just for the sake of time, I'll move forward here. So a pollinator is defined by anything that helps move pollen from the male anther to the female stigma on a flower. So there are a lot of different animals here that can do that. Um, some of them are better at doing it than others. You can see, I listed here a lacewing on the far left and an assassin bug on the far right. Both of them are visiting flowers. They're very important natural enemies, important beneficial insects that depend on flowers for a certain part of their life cycle, but they're not moving that pollen around in a very effective way. A lot of these other, and I also <laughs> put hand pollination, right? Because humans could be pollinators too, although I hope it doesn't come to that. I would really love for the, the bees and the, <laughs> the beetles to be doing this for us. Um, but yeah, so let's talk about some of these pollinators here. Um, I, I wanna highlight that bees get a lot of the attention as pollinators because they are just objectively the most efficient and the most important, therefore the most important pollinators. They're the most efficient for a couple different reasons. Um, one is that they're actively collecting and transporting pollen to feed to their young. So actually, if you go back here, you think about some of these other pollinators that are visiting flowers, you know, butterflies, moths, flies, beetles, their larvae are not consuming pollen. Instead, they're often carnivorous or they're eating vegetation, they're herbivores. Um, but baby or larval bees are eating pollen and nectar. And the adults are eating pollen and nectar as well. So the bees are actually collecting that and bringing that back to the nest to feed their babies. 
The other thing that makes them really efficient pollinators is that they do this thing called um, kind of floral fidelity or floral constancy. So they go to the same type of flower over and over and over again. So for example, in the spring, they're not gonna go to an apple blossom and then a dandelion and then a willow. They're gonna go to a willow, to a willow, to a willow. And so from a plant's perspective, that's exactly what you want. Because if you're a willow, you can't really do anything with dandelion pollen. So that's what makes them really efficient pollinators. And I wanna uh, talk about a little bit the tremendous bee diversity out there. This is obviously a Photoshopped picture, but it's just kind of cool to show the different sizes and morphologies of bees out there, right? This is the smallest bee in North America, Pertida, um, on top of the head of one of the largest bees in North America, uh, Xylocopa, which is a, a large carpenter bee. There's a lot of different ways to display this um, bee diversity. Um, there's a lot going on in this picture too. Um, I'll just draw your eyes to a couple different spots here. So in the center, total bee species, 3,600 or so. Um, that's number of bee species that we have in um, North America, or maybe that's just the United States actually. Um, and you can see that by all the different symbols, they have different nesting behaviors, different kind of social behaviors. Um, and, I, and then the other thing I wanna highlight here is this, this red circle oblong thing where that's highlighting you know, the number of bumblebee species and honeybee species, right? It's, uh, we often think of native bees and we think about bumblebees or something, um, but they really don't represent very much diversity compared to all these other um, bees out there. And this is just another way to visualize that diversity. So um, you can think about the different morphologies that they show. So these are just showing different kinds of tongue lengths relative to their body size. You can see some of them have really short tongues. Some have pretty long tongues. Obviously there's a, a moth in there just for kind of comparison. Um, and e even that Kalides up in the top kind of middle right, um, that has like a bifurcated tongue. You can see these are different adaptations to work with different kinds of flowers. This is another way to think about that diversity. So see, this is different kinds of bees carrying pollen. You can see there's variation in pollen color, different places where they carry that pollen. Some of it, some of them carry it up high on their armpits. Some of it, them carry it low on their bellies. Um, they're working flowers in different ways. And thank goodness, because now we have this diversity of flowers out there throughout the growing season. This is just a small sampling of some of the inflorescences that. Um, show up in our environment in the upper Midwest. And you can see there's just so much beauty and diversity out there. And that is because of these kind of adaptations, the flowers and the, and the bees working together. Um, so in order to get that diversity of bees, we need a diversity of plants. And I have to just say here, just make some note about honeybees. Um, a lot of people, think about bee conservation and they conjure up an image about of a honeybee. And even if you just Google save the bees images, they're almost always going to be honeybees. Um, but truly, these honeybees are not at risk of extinction. They're managed by humans. Um, they, they are actually considered livestock. Um, their nest is provided for them. They're stewarded. Um, they are, you know, facing major challenges, just like some of our native bees are. But in terms of pollinator conservation efforts, um, what we really should be focusing on are these native bees of which um, many are at risk of extinction. They're not stewarded by humans in the same way that honeybees are. Um, we're still learning a lot about them and they're really dependent on native wildflowers. Um, so now that I've emphasized that they're <laughs> dependent on native wildflowers, you know, there's also this part of their biology that we really need to think about too, which is nesting behaviors. And I like to break it down into these different groups for, especially for land managers. It's a little easier to think about the bee diversity in terms of how bees nest. Um, about 1% or maybe even less of our native bee diversity is represented by bumblebees, sort of social, our one truly social native bee. Um, and then 
I just heard Elaine Evans. Some of you may know her. She's kind of a bumblebee expert in Minnesota. Last night, she gave a talk and said that ground nesting bees actually represent about 80% of native bees. So it, it, what I can say is that between 70 and 80% of our native bees nest in the ground. So a majority of them are ground nesting. They're solitary. And then the rest of them are also solitary, but nesting in stems or wood cavities and that kind of thing. Um, this is just an example of some of those nesting behaviors to visualize it a little bit. Um, some of them are like little tiny carpenter bees. They're, they're burrowing nests um, into, uh, woody stems or even hard stems like, um, I don't know, cup plant or silphiums. A um, lot of our native wildflowers um, are host sites for stem nesting bees. A um, lot of them are under the ground. This can be anywhere from a couple inches underground to a couple feet, depending on the size of the bee and the, the substrate. Um, just to kind of start wrapping our head around what this might look like in your environment. The typical life cycle of a solitary bee will start kind of just at the top. Obviously, we think of bees, we think of them on flowers, collecting pollen. Um, that is an important part of their life cycle, of course. Um, that's the part that we see the most. Um, they collect that pollen. Maybe it's for a couple of weeks during the year. Sometimes they are long lived and they, they are foraging for a couple months. Um, they're depositing pollen in their little nests, uh, nest cells, um, putting some pollen, sometimes with some nectar in there, depositing an egg on it. The egg then eventually hatches and consumes that pollen um, and then pupates and emerges the next year usually um, and repeats the whole cycle. Um, and what I really wanna emphasize here, you might be kind of getting a hint at it, is that yes, the wildflowers are very important. They drive a lot of this cycle, um, but nest protection is also equally important uh, for bees. So I think that often gets forgotten uh, when we are trying to build habitat for them. And I just have to say here, I mean, a lot of people think, oh yeah, I know, I know ground nesting bees. I've encountered those before. <laughs> but what they've likely encountered are these social wasps um, that are very territorial and defensive. Um, they have large colonies, much like honeybees. There's redundancy in the colony. They can afford to go out and be territorial, uh, whereas solitary ground nesting bees are not defensive in that same way at all. You, they're very timid. Um, they they do have the positive have the um, ability to sting, um, but they're unlikely to go out of their way. They don't want to harm themselves because there's no redundancy. They're solitary. If she dies, her she has, you know, she's finished in terms of um, being able to provision more nest cells. This is just another way to visualize what, the, what might be happening, not just underground, but in stems. So they'll pack a little pollen into a, a little mud um, provisioned nest cell, lay an egg on it. Um, and what's important here to say is that, you know, bees need to forage pretty close to their nest, depending on the the size of the bee and kind of the landscape, um, but it can take over a thousand trips to make one of these little, to provision one of these little cells. That's a lot of trips, a lot of effort. They're not making huge colonies. Some of these bees maybe only make 10 or 20 different um, eggs in their lifetime. So this is a lot of work for these solitary bees. And then the other contrast, this is really, this is a really different life cycle. Bumblebees, which are social, um, we have about 45 different species in the US, um, about 26 different species in the East. Um, they do build nests a little bit like honeybees in that they have certain um, social system, uh, but they have really small nests compared to honeybees. Like, uh, anywhere from 100 to maybe three or 400 workers. Um, so pretty small compared to honeybees. The bumblebee life cycle is also pretty different from honeybees in that the whole colony doesn't overwinter. The only uh, individual that overwinters is this hibernating queen. So at the top there, that's kind of where we are now, getting ready for those huge queens to emerge from their um, hibernacula. 
they emerge, they, you've probably seen them kind of, especially in the woods um, in the spring, just kind of like slowly looking for, for nests, um, nesting sites. They, they're just uh, really impressive to see in the spring. So they, what is really important is that in the spring, they need good foraging resources to find their nest, to start to build up that colony. Later on in the summer, they kind of have peak colonies with a lot of workers. And then finally, towards the end of the summer, they start laying eggs and um, new queens and males finally start to emerge. And they leave their nests and mate. And then pretty much everybody dies. Um, all the workers and all the males, all everybody except for the newly mated queens. So what's really important to note in the life cycle is that those, you know, there's a lot of vulnerability in the fall and in the spring for those queens. The potentially the whole population kind of uh, relies on those. So they need really good foraging resources first thing in the spring, and they need really good abundant resources late in the fall. Um, this is just another way to visualize. This is where I'm losing a little bit of the dynamic when we have to do this virtually. Um, it'd be really fun if any of you have ever encountered a bumblebee nest. It'd be really fun if you typed it into the chat to just show all the random places they can nest sometimes. It's, um, you know, I've encountered them most often in um, bunch grass kind of stem, like the litter of a big bunch grass. Um, but I've also seen them in old outbuildings. Um, people encounter them in really funny places, usually associated with um, rodent nests, former rodent nests, something that's warm and cozy. And then there's this other group of bees, which kind of defies at least nesting categorization. Um, they are called cuckoo bees, or sometimes known as kleptoparasites. And this, this is, represents about 20% of the bee diversity out there. And these are bees, just like cuckoo birds, they um, parasitize their hosts. Um, so these are other host, other bees that they go in, they, um, like those nests that we were looking at underground, they'll go in, um, kill the host larvae, and then lay their own eggs. Uh, and, or maybe the eggs hatch and the larvae eat the host larvae, right? And then they eat the pollen supplies. So they're a little bit wasp-like. They don't have to collect any of their own pollen and nectar. They don't provision nests for their young. They just take over somebody else's nest. And a lot of people might think, well, that's kind of a jerk thing to do. <laughs> um, but it's actually, I love seeing these kinds of bees in the environment because then I know that they have healthy um, host populations. And so it just means that we have a really healthy bee community out there. Okay, so now I'm slowly transitioning here into the, like the how. So these are getting into a little bit of like, we know a little bit about the bees and how do we provide habitat for them? Um, so thinking about plants and management and so forth. So certain bees or certain um, plants need certain bees. So here's two examples of really different floral structures. Um, one we might consider restricted access, this bottle junction, and another one we might consider open access. So the restricted access bottle junction, it never opens up any bigger than that. It just takes a really large bee to pry that flower open and get into the resources and pollinate um, the, um, move that pollen around, right? Whereas, this stiff golden rod, obviously there are a lot of visitors there. The pollen and nectar are just right there on the surface, easy to move around. Um, and so, you know, there's, this has implications for conservation in the landscape because, you know, restricted access plants, if we start to lose some of those pollinators, we might start to lose those restricted access plants more quickly because we don't have as many seeds and, and that kind of thing. Whereas open access plants, that have a diversity of bees and pollinators um, may persist in the landscape longer. Um, there are a lot, some of you may have heard of buzz pollination. It's just this really cool thing where some plants actually require um, a certain kind of buzzing frequency to release their pollen. Usually that um, buzzing, buzz pollination happens by um, a bumblebee coming to visit. 
but there are other kinds of native bees that also do buds pollination. This is just a list of some of the plant um, groups that require buds pollination. Um, some of them don't even occur in the upper Midwest, but it's just interesting to see um, this variety of them. And it's just, it's, it's cool to know that this is happening on certain plants. For example, I visited a farm in Wisconsin a couple years ago in May on a cool, um, a cool kind of cloudy day in May. And I walked up to their, um, to their bluff prairie and um, the shooting stars were abundant. And of course there were no bees out at all on that day because it was too cool. But the shooting stars had these really huge um, like seed pods on them. And from that, I could tell, wow, this place has a really healthy bumblebee population. Um, so knowing a little bit about these plants and the associations they have with bees can help you assess kind of the community. Um, and then some bees, so before we talked about plants that need certain bees, um, some bees need certain plants. Um, there are a lot of generalists and specialists out there. Specialist bees we call oligolectic, which is sort of like picky eater bees. They specialize on one plant family or maybe even a, just a genus. Um, the asters and the legume family are kind of, they host a lot of specialist bees. Um, but Salix, the, the willows, they also host a lot of specialist bees. And then I threw in this other plant family, well, really this genus, um, Lysimachia, the native loosestrifes. They also host a kind of rare-ish uh, native bee, Macropus. This is an oil collecting bee that actually relies on Lysimachia. Um, it collects its floral oils and then lines it, its nest cells with those oils. And I put this in here mainly because it's just an example of when we add more plant diversity and especially from different plant families, we're likely to attract a bunch of different um, invertebrates to, the, to our environment. And, and, and Lysimachia in particular is a species that um, I don't often see in restoration seed mixes and so forth. Um, so try to get as much diversity in your planting as possible. Um, for those of you who might be interested in learning more about pollen specialist bees, there's a really well-researched great list um, that Jared Fowler put together. I have it linked here. Hopefully it'll get linked in the chat at some point as well. And for those of you who think I've already forgotten all the other cool pollinators out there, I just have to put in a little nod for butterflies and moths. Some of you might be uh, Lepidoptera enthusiasts. Um, Obviously, I have monarchs here showing that, you know, all of us think we know monarchs rely on milkweed, um, but it's not just monarchs. A lot of our leps, our moths and butterflies have kind of special plant host needs. Some of them are real generalists, but some of them really do specialize on certain vegetation. So the caterpillar is eating a certain kind of vegetation, and then when it, it closes or emerges as a, an adult, it requires certain kinds of nectar plants. If you're interested in learning about some of those associations, the Xerces Society has a really great book on gardening for butterflies and really goes into all those relationships. Um, and then there are a few other resources I want to highlight on this. If you've never uh, explored this tool, the Native Plant Finder by the National Wildlife Federation, um, it's a really cool place to explore. So at the top, I just... Um, you can see in the red circle up there. I just chose a kind of a random Madison area zip code. And you can see it filters different flowers and grasses and then also woody species. And it shows how many butterflies and moths um, are dependent on those. So you can kind of filter and create these powerhouse seed mixes or plantings, right? That host a lot of different um, uh, moths and butterflies. And you can fill in some gaps too. So when I'm evaluating a seed mix, I think, well, if I added these two additional plant species, I might attract 20 more or 30 more different um, caterpillars, right? And that means more birds and so forth. And then I wanna highlight one more tool for choosing species that can help, like especially choosing plant species that can help host butterflies and moths. I think this is a tool that is a little bit more for the advanced um, 
planner or ecologist, um, but I don't think it's used nearly as much as it should be. Um, so this is the Federal Highway Administration's Eco-Regional Revegetation Application Tool. Total mouthful. I just always type in FHWA ERA and then Google can find it. <laughs> Um, but basically, this is this enormous database of um, native and I think naturalized species in there, where they occur, and it has the, um, like tons of different attributes for each species in there, including these different um, attributes that they've labeled workhorse species for either revegetation or for workhorse species for pollinators. So this is just an example of how it works. I chose this um, north central hardwood, hardwood forests. Um, area, you can download the, the data set. And that's what I prefer to do because I'm more comfortable in Excel and also it's faster. Uh, or you can view all of the plants in the web browser itself. And I find that's a little slower clunky because there can be hundreds or thousands of species in here. Um, and I know this is really small so, and you won't be able to see it all. <laughs> but this is just an example of what it would look like in the browser when you pull it up. So it, it it, allow, it spits out all the different species that are available. It has all these different, like 50, like I said, 50 different attribute fields. Um, one of them is pollinator value, very high, high. Um, you can filter that so you can create a seed mix that's just a very high value of species. You can filter by um, species that are known to be really good for bumblebees, honeybees, moths monarch larval host, monarch nectar host, hummingbirds. I mean, you can really design mixes in a sophisticated way using this data set. It's really worth exploring, especially if you can, if you like getting kind of nerdy in Excel. So that's my plug for the ERA tool. And then, so we've talked about kind of nesting needs and floral needs, and I, I can't move on without saying something about pesticide protection. Um, this is a, just a reality in our environments these days, especially in the upper Midwest. And we really should be trying our best to protect habitat, especially that really high, quali quite high quality habitat that we have in the Driftless area um, from pesticide drift. Um, these are just a few kind of Xerxes Society um, guides for number, you know, minimum width um, for different kinds of herbicide or, or pesticide applications. The key is just to communicate with surrounding landowners. To, and it's not just in um, rural landscapes. This is definitely something that needs to be discussed even in urban landscapes. So just to summarize here, all pollinators need diverse vegetation for season long nectar, pollen, and host plants. Um, they need shelter all year round for nesting and overwintering, and they need refuge from pesticides. Uh, I wanna say just a couple words about managing land for native pollinators. Obviously in a prairie landscape, we, to maintain the prairie, we have to disturb it and provide some management or stewardship, whether that's grazing or fire or mowing. Um, but with that management, we can have some negative impacts as well. So I just wanna highlight a few best management practices um, and at the risk of oversimplifying, I'm just going to, we can talk about it later, maybe afterwards with questions, but I just want to say a few things about this. So prescribed fire is this really amazing tool that we like to use when we're doing prairie conservation and restoration. Um, it can maintain big open landscapes. The interesting thing is there's a sort of paradox with invertebrates in that a lot of our pollinators prefer nectar plants that are reliant on fire. However, they themselves are very vulnerable to fire and grazing. So when they're nesting or when they're little larval um, caterpillars, they can be very vulnerable to fire. So when we are managing for open landscapes, we should do it in a really patchwork way. So that brings me to just this final best management practices. And this is burning, grazing, haying, all of these have slightly different impacts on pollinators. Um, but like I said, I'm gonna oversimplify a little bit and just say, you know, don't manage or burn more than one third of the habitat at a time. That way you're always leaving some adequate refugia um, to repopulate the burned areas. Try to leave a few years um, 
in between uh, the next burn or the next um, management practice. Um, try to do it in the off season, sort of dormant season. Um, map where you're doing this so that you can keep track of this from year to year. Um, and you know, if you're trying to enhance a grassland, these management um, periods can be a really great way for to open up the, the litter and do some interseeding as well. Okay, so this is when I talk about the why, the who, kind of the like the how, and now this is kind of the more the fun part, um, just trying to learn about who these animals are, trying to trying to wrap your head around the diversity and see if you can figure out some of the identification tips. Um, so here's this question, you know, how do you identify a bee? And um, some of you, you know, one of these is a bee and one is not. And I don't know if you guys want to think about this or type it into the chat, but basically, <laughs> unfortunately on Zoom, I can't do too much dynamic stuff here, but the one on the left is not a bee. This is a cerfid fly. Looks a lot like a bee is so often mistaken for a bee that we sometimes have publications like this that um, feature flies on things, you know, big headlines about pollinator conservation. This happens all the time, especially as more and more papers come out about, um, about pollinator decline and then it gets kind of brought into um, mainstream media. <laughs> so it is, inter it is wise to kind of wrap your head around some of these ID uh, techniques. By the way, these are both flies, not bees. <laughs> So one way that Xerxes has tried to help um, just like community scientists get their heads around the bee diversity out there is to develop this citizen science monitoring guide. And it's a little crude for any of you who have actually had bee taxonomy or have some experience identifying these, but this is, it's really just a simple way to do monitoring in the field without having to do um, lethal captures. So the first thing that the guide does is kind of help you identify what is a non-bee. So is it a butterfly, moth, beetle, so forth, or is it a bee, right? So there's kind of these trees to help you figure that out. Um, and then <laughs> it's just another bee look like they go through some of these um, basic questions or basic images and help you kind of piece apart those. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna come back to that guide in a second, but I wanna go over some of the key characteristics of bees, that bees are much like wasps. They're very closely related. They evolved from wasps, um, but they became better at collecting pollen and nectar. Um, I have here that they have long tongues, but as you saw in the other picture, they have a variety of tongue lengths. Um, they do have branched hairs and these very specialized hairs on certain parts of their body, scopa. Um, these are pollen collecting hairs. Um, usually it's on their, um, on their hind legs, but often for some um, bee families, it's on their, their bellies. And then there's some, a few other things that help me identify bees versus other animal or other uh, insects out there. They, they have four wings. That's not always the easiest thing to, to observe um, on a flower. Um, but the other characteristics that they carrying the females, especially, of course, um, are carrying large loads of pollen. That's a real giveaway. So on that one, you can see it has like a big chap leg full of pollen, um, longhorn bee right there. They're usually pretty hairy. And then a real key thing for me is that um, their eyes are on the side of their head like that. That's a really clear image there on the lower right. Um, the, the eyes are on the side of the head. Okay, so focus on that for a second. Um, versus, you know, bee lookalikes. So these are all flies. They have two wings. Um, like I said, that's not the easiest thing to see on the flower. Although if you have really good um, camera, you might be able to use that for ID. They basically aren't carrying around pollen, although they are considered pollinators in a lot of cases. Um, usually they're not very hairy, although with invertebrates, there's always some variation. And then the key thing, like I said, um, comparing it to bees is that their eyes are usually huge. They usually take up most of the head. So you can see on almost all these images of flies here, the eyes are almost like connected. They're really taking up most of the head. 
And then the other thing is that they just have these short little antennae um, to be pejorative. They're kind of like these, I don't know, little pathetic little antennae, right? Versus, actually I'll go back here, the long antennae on the bees. And wasps are also very similar looking in some cases, especially to cuckoo bees. Um, they do have four wings like bees. They have tough looking bodies because a lot of them are predators. Um, so they actually are tough. <laughs> they usually aren't carrying around pollen. They're not very hairy because they don't need to carry pollen around. Um, and the color that they show on their bodies in the exoskeleton are like in the skin, right? Versus a lot of the bees have it just color variation in the hairs on their body. So this is what the guide does. And I could give a whole workshop, all day workshop on how to use this guide. But essentially once you key it out to, the, okay, yes, I have a bee. We've developed these 10 categories of just little oversimplified, but also useful um, ways to separate out the bee diversity. So it's a, either a honeybee or a bumblebee or something that we call chap leg bee. You know, this is morphology that we're looking at, right? Um, it's a medium dark bee or a green swept bee, a tiny bee and so forth, right? Um, and these can be really useful categories for, for sep finding out what kind of diversity you have out there and if your planting is actually bringing in this diversity of pollinators. So it is important to learn some of the identific identification techniques because that translates into more effective conservation, right? Um, if we learn about these animals and their life cycles and what they need, um, we are going to make better habitat for them. Um, and we have a lot more to learn. So I encourage you all to get involved in, um, in community science or citizen science projects to, to be part of this movement of learning about these animals that we really need to protect now. These are a few tools that Xerces has. I'm gonna talk about a couple other um, uh, really cool community science projects. One is Bumblebee Watch. So this is just for if you happen to encounter a bumblebee, take a picture of it, you can upload it to Bumblebee Watch. This is something that Xerces manages with a few other partners. Um, it will help guide you through the identification. And then once you upload your photos, experts will verify um, the species. And then this data goes directly to US Fish and Wildlife. So for example, this is really important data. Um, this is all, these are all the observations made on Bumblebee Watch in you know, the Northeast and Great Lakes region of um, Rusty Patch Bumblebee. And you can see over a few years, a lot of the observations are happening in Minnesota and Wisconsin, not so much in the former historic range of the other parts of the Great Lakes. Um, so this is really important information. Likewise, there's a really cool organization. I know it's been plugged in other um, BMAP talks too, but join Bumblebee Brigade. That way, that's a little bit more um, systematized way to learn about the bumblebees and then go out on an assigned transect or some way to be more involved on a regular basis. Um, so join Bumblebee Brigade, that data also gets fed into Fish and Wildlife Service recommendations. I know I've gone a little bit longer than anticipated. So what I wanna do is just talk to you about the Xerces website. We have one of the cool things that our organization does is develop all of these free downloadable resources that are on our website. Um, all designed to help you with your conservation and restoration efforts, not just on your own land, but also in your communities. So go explore our publications library um, and you can find a lot of cool tools there. And I'll just leave it at that. Um, I'm guessing there might be some questions. I also, if you're interested, we have a quiz at the end, um, but we could get into that later. So I will leave it there, I think and just leave my contact info up so that if anybody wants to grab that, um, if you have more burning questions, you wanna reach out to me afterwards. So yeah, thank you. Thank you, Karen. Wow, that was just chock full of so many fun tips and great facts. 
Um, we do have a couple of questions that are already in the chat. I will start with those and I will invite the audience to continue putting questions there and we will get to as many as we can. Um, let's see, I'm gonna scroll up a little bit here to find, um, here's a question from Carol about nesting habitat. Does nesting habitat need to be relatively undisturbed soils? Yes, <laughs> relative, maybe being the operative word. Um, yes, so, you know, some bees nest fairly deep, um, not many, because most of them are fairly small, so they don't go very deep. Um, but for example, squash bees, squash bees are a little bit bigger, they might nest deep enough that if you were to shallow till, in an area where they were nesting, you might not disturb the whole nest. <laughs> um, but, but yes, basically undisturbed habitat is what is going to allow them to finish their life cycle as a general rule. Um, and so this, you know, not disturbing soil is like the easiest and um, most kind of straightforward recommendation. Um, but, you know, when it comes to stem nesting bees, it can get a little um, more complicated because they're kind of all over in the environment and they're using dead stems from previous years that, so for example, let's think about um, like Monarda, a bergamot stem, you know, one that flowered this year, a bee didn't nest in it this year, it was flowering. It might, let's say it breaks off this winter and creates an opening in that stem the next season, so in 2021, a bee might find that stem and go nest in it. And then it needs to get through the winter of 2021, 2022 to emerge in 2023, right? And so um, it's a little bit longer term thinking, especially for gardeners or for, for anybody who's managing um, prairie units uh, that, and you're trying to attract stem nesters, for example, but yeah. Got it. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Here's a question from Gail. I think that this dates back to the point in the presentation when you were talking about the revegetation, the ERA database. Mm -hmm. And Gail asks, does pollinator value mean nectar as well as pollen? I think so. I think um, there is a really extensive, um, like a, a data kind of how they collected their data, how they pooled data. It's, it's data from peer reviewed literature, um, insect collections across the country. Um, and so you can go in and find out for every field, how they sorted their data. Um, I think of it when I sort that way, I think of it um, as both, as nectar and pollen. But it could be factoring in other things like, um, I don't know, maybe there's even a weight for certain kinds of pollinators that are really important or that um, maybe it hosts, uh, it's known to attract more diversity or something like that. Um, and so therefore it's being considered high, very high value. It's worth exploring the, their, their reasoning because they do lay most of that out. Got it. All right, the next question is from my mom. <laughs> Hi, Karen. She wants, she wants to get into the weeds with fire. Um, she asks, can you talk about the resistance of ground nesting, be nesting bees as opposed to stem nesting bees to fire? Um, from the gut, I'll <laughs> say. So <laughs> don't hold me to any literature that you've recently published on this, <laughs> but... Um, you know, I would say um, ground nesting bees are relatively more insulated from impacts of fire, um, especially depending on how deep they're nesting. Whereas anything that is nesting above ground is obviously much more vulnerable to fire. Um, some of those nests are like on prairie edges using old, um, like beetle bore holes, maybe in certain kinds of wood or decaying wood. Um, so those are maybe less vulnerable to fire. Um, 
but yeah, I guess I would say, <laughs> it, I'm just going intuition here. <laughs> but yeah, uh, ground nesting bees, I think are, have a little bit more resilience to fire. And maybe that's an adaptation why we have a lot more um, ground nesting bees because it's, you know, they can resist some of the, they can be more resilient to the various disturbances in the environment. Yep, makes sense. All right, here is a question comparing native bees and honeybees. Um, so invasive plants are a real problem in managing our prairies. If native bees have evolved and are dependent upon native wildflowers, then are non-native bees, honeybees, the primary pollinators for our non-native or invasive plant species? Um, I won't say that they're the primary pollinators. Native pollinators will, especially generalists, will go to non-native plants sometimes. Um, in fact, often, especially if that's more abundant in the environment. Um, but yes, I mean, the, the impact of having too many honeybees in the environment can um, promote either invasive or non-native um, species in our environment. It's a, it can be a real problem in natural areas. Um, and Xerces has a, a policy statement on this, a recommendation, sort of a lit review on the impacts of having honeybees in natural areas. So there's, um, there are a lot of impacts. It's on native plant communities. It's on um, native bees that might otherwise be foraging on uh, native flowers and um, and so therefore honeybees are sort of extracting uh, nectar and pollen that would be growing <laughs> native bees. Um, yeah, so I think I might be losing sight of the original question, but um, honeybees can promote invasive species is kind of a bottom line. <laughs> Got it. All right, just a couple more questions and then we will sign off for the evening. Um, let's see, does it help to scrape soil to provide open bare spots for bee nesting? I think I wouldn't do that in any significant way. I think um, what, you know, you may have other goals um, that would be achieved by scraping some soil because maybe you actually want a few annuals or biennials or disturbance loving plants to occur there, um, but I wouldn't do it for the sake of native bee nesting. I think just there are a lot of native bees that actually will nest in really vegetated areas, not just sandy open areas. Um, we know a lot more, I think, about the bees that nest in open areas because they're a little more obvious and easy to see and um, yeah, easier to observe, but um, I, I wouldn't do that. I would do some other management um, that's not disturbing soil. I would either burn a little bit more frequently or mow or actually haying is a really, um, if possible, better alternative than mowing because it actually lifts that vegetation offsite and creates those open spaces. So um, I wouldn't advise scraping. <laughs> All right, and let's close with one more question, a specific question about reporting in Minnesota. If you are reporting rusty patch bumblebees in Minnesota, what site would you suggest? Specifically one that only shows details to scientists. Um, in other words, this person might be, okay, so I would, I would choose Bumblebee Watch and you can make your information private. Um, if you, really believe that you found a rusty patch bumblebee, um, you could contact um, somebody like Elaine Evans, um, who's from the University of Minnesota Bee Lab directly. She's one of the verifiers on Bumblebee Watch. Um, you know, one thing I for neglected to mention is that iNaturalist is also a good resource for just trying to identify lots of different um, taxa and especially invertebrates and their verifiers on there too. And I think you can do set the settings so that it's private on there as well. Um, Got it. Great. 
Well, boy, Karen, I want to thank you again. What a wealth of information. I don't know about everybody else, but I have certainly been keeping notes and have just learned all sorts of great tidbits and facts that I am going to implement. So thank you so much for joining us. To all of our participants and audience members, thanks to you too. And I hope everybody stays warm and stays well. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Good night. Bye. Bye-bye.